Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear reports from Dan Friedel and Anna Mateo. John Russell tells us about elliptical structures in this week's Everyday Grammar Report. And Kelly Jean Kelly brings us part three of the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. But first, here is Dan Friedel. American President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke for the fifth time Thursday as leaders of the world's biggest powers. The call began at 1233 UTC and ended more than two hours later. It comes as concerns are rising over the issue of Taiwan and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The two leaders also disagreed on health economic policy, and human rights issues. The latest dispute has been the possible visit of U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. Pelosi would be the highest-ranking U.S. elected official to travel to Taiwan since 1997. Then-Speaker Newt Gingrich visited the island when China was preparing to celebrate Hong Kong's return from Britain. The U.S. does not have official diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but continues informal relations and defense ties. Biden last week told reporters that U.S. military officials believed it was not a good idea for the speaker to visit the island now. China considers self-governing Taiwan a part of its territory. On Wednesday, a foreign ministry spokesman said such a visit could be met with forceful responses. And he added, all ensuing consequences shall be borne by the U.S., Martin Chorzempa is an expert at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He told Reuters that talking about the Taiwan issue could serve Xi by taking attention away from China's slowing economy. Scott Kennedy of Washington's Center for Strategic and International Studies added that the risk of a major crisis is well above zero, and a Biden-Xi call was important to avoid an unwanted clash. John Kirby is a U.S. national security spokesman. He said Wednesday before the call that it was important for Biden and Xi to speak together regularly The president wants to make sure that the lines of communication with President Xi remain open because they need to, Kirby told reporters. He said there are issues on which cooperation is possible and others where there is tension. I'm Dan Friedel. A fossil of a 560 million year old creature has been named after a famous British naturalist and broadcaster. Researchers say Aurora Lumina attenborii may have been the first animal predator, or hunter. The creature is named after 96-year-old David Attenborough, who has also written many books about the natural world. He reportedly said he was truly delighted with the honor. The first part of the name, Aurora Lumina, means dawn lantern 
in the Latin language. Phil Wilby studies ancient life at the British Geological Survey. He told the Associated Press, "It is believed that modern animal groups like jellyfish appeared 540 million years ago in the Cambrian explosion." But this predator, he said, predates that by 20 million years. Scientists call the period between about 541 million to 530 million years ago the Cambrian explosion. During that time, many kinds of animals and plants developed. Also during that period. Creatures with hard body parts, such as shells made of calcium carbonate, appeared. Wilby said it was massively exciting to know that the fossil was one of possibly many that can help us understand when complex life began on Earth. A paleontologist studies ancient life. Mostly through its mineralized remains, which are known as fossils. The fossil of the newly named creature was found in Charnwood Forest, near Leicester, in central England. That area is where Attenborough used to go fossil hunting. Scientists say Aurora lumina attenborii. Might be the earliest creature known to have a form of skeleton. They said it is related to the animal group that includes corals, jellyfish, and anemones. Frankie Dunn is a researcher at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. She said the fossil is very different from other fossils. Found in Charnwood Forest, and around the world. Dunn said, unlike most other fossils from the Cambrian period, this one clearly has a skeleton, with densely packed tentacles, that would have waved around in the water, capturing passing food, much like corals and sea anemones do today. I'm Anna Mateo. There is an important part of grammar that is common in writing and everyday speech, but unlike many other subjects in grammar, this subject is defined by what is not expressed. What is this mysterious subject? In today's report, we will explore elliptical structures. Let's start with a few important terms and ideas. Clauses are groups of words with a subject and a predicate. When part of a clause, generally part of the predicate, is left out but still understood, we get an elliptical clause. Imagine you are watching an American television show. You hear the following: Who is going to cook dinner? I will. In this case, the modal will appeared without a main verb. The complete statement is "I will cook dinner." The words "cook dinner" are understood between the speakers, although unspoken. This is a kind of elliptical clause. Elliptical structures are a wonderful way to avoid repeating words. They can make your statements more natural or more complex, but they can also reduce clarity if used incorrectly. The main problem with elliptical structures is that they depend on an absent part of a sentence being understood by another person. If parts of the sentence do not agree, for example, the subject and implied verb do not agree, then the sentence can become unclear. There are a few different kinds of elliptical structures: noun ellipsis, verb ellipsis, and verb phrase ellipsis. In a noun ellipsis, 
a noun is left out. In a verb ellipsis, a verb is left out. And in a verb phrase ellipsis, a verb phrase is left out. You already learned about an example of a verb phrase ellipsis, our example about cooking dinner. The verb phrase, cook dinner, was not expressed. All that remained were the words, I will. What about a verb ellipsis, one that does not have a modal such as will or can? One common way a verb ellipsis appears is in sentences with two or more independent clauses. These clauses are joined by a semicolon. Consider this example. Tom took a train. Mary a cab. In this example, the verb in the second part of the sentence does not appear. This sentence replaces two statements. Tom took a train. Mary took a cab. Since the same verb form, took, repeats between the two statements, you can join them with a semicolon and remove took from the second part of the sentence. That is how we arrive at Tom took a train, Mary a cab. This structure could be used in everyday speech or in formal writing. Let's take some time to work with this idea. Use the following nouns and verbs to make a sentence that uses an elliptical structure. You might have to add a few more short words such as the, a, or an. John, Sally, order, pizza, sandwich. Pause the audio and think of your answer before continuing. Here is one possible answer. John ordered a sandwich. Sally, a pizza. In this sentence, the past tense of the verb order does not appear in the second part of the sentence. This is because it is understood the same verb form appears in the first part of the sentence. If we were to pull apart the sentence into two separate statements, it would be the following. John ordered a sandwich. Sally ordered a pizza. But instead of repeating the same verb, we joined the two statements into one sentence that has a semicolon and a comma. That is how we arrive at... John ordered a sandwich. Sally a pizza. Now let's try a different question. Use the following nouns, pronoun, and verb to make a sentence that uses an elliptical structure. You might have to add a few more short words, such as the, a, or an. We, Bob, prefer live music recordings. Pause the audio and think of your answer before continuing. This question was a trick question. You might think that the answer is this. We prefer live music. Bob recordings. An elliptical structure might not be the best choice here. The reason is because the verb prefer should be used in two different ways in the sentence. In the first part, prefer agrees with the subject, we. In the second part, the verb form prefers agrees with the subject, Bob. In other words, if we pulled apart the sentence into two separate statements, it would be something like this. We prefer live music. Bob prefers recordings. So, we would have to use a different kind of sentence to express this idea. It could be, for example, We prefer live music. Bob prefers recordings. The central idea in today's report is that elliptical structures suggest language but do not directly express it. We will end this report with a question for you. We noted, but did not give an example of, a noun ellipsis. Can you think of an example? Write to us in the comments section of our website, 
learningenglish.voanews.com. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we will finish our story about Abraham Lincoln. He led the United States during the Civil War. That conflict lasted from 1861 to 1865. In it, the southern states of the Confederacy battled the northern states of the Union. As a wartime president, Lincoln was known for several things. He was actively involved in plotting the military campaign. When Lincoln was unhappy with the performance of his top generals, he dismissed them. He also greatly increased the power of the presidency, even beyond what the U.S. Constitution permitted. And Lincoln struck at the issue at the heart of the Civil War, slavery. He ordered that enslaved people in the Confederate States be forever free. His order is called the Emancipation Proclamation. Seven months after the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, the Confederacy and the Union clashed in the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. The Army of Confederate General Robert E. Lee was on the offensive. Lee planned to move the fighting out of the South and invade the North. He won a major victory against Union forces at Chancellorsville, Virginia. Then he pushed across Maryland and into Pennsylvania. A Union army, led by General George Meade, met Lee's troops near a small crossroads town called Gettysburg. In the first days of July 1863, a little more than two years after the start of the Civil War, Confederate and Union troops each struggled to claim the territory. Both sides suffered massive casualties. But Lee believed Confederate troops were close to winning and that Meade had spread his soldiers thin. So, on the third day of fighting, he ordered a direct attack on Union forces. Lee's soldiers aimed at the center of the Union line, positioned behind stone walls at the top of a ridge, or raised area. Confederates first used cannons to fire artillery at the ridge. Then about 15,000 Confederate soldiers began marching across more than a kilometer of an open field. The Union soldiers behind the walls fired on them. More Union forces attacked the Confederate soldiers on the left and right. In half an hour, three-quarters of the soldiers in the open field had been killed or wounded. Thousands more on each side also died. The surviving Confederate forces quickly withdrew and waited for Meade to attack again. But Much to Lincoln's dissatisfaction, he did not. The following morning, Lee led the survivors back to Virginia. He left behind 28,000 soldiers dead, wounded, or missing, more than one-third of his total army. The Union had suffered 23,000 casualties, almost as many. The Battle of Gettysburg is important in American history, for several reasons. One is the large number of killed and wounded soldiers, the largest until World War II in the 20th century. Another reason is because it was a turning point in the war. It ended Lee's invasion of the North and weakened his army permanently. Over the same days, Union troops won another major victory under General Ulysses S. Grant in the southern city of Vicksburg, Mississippi. The battles at Vicksburg and Gettysburg began to turn the conflict to the Union's favor. Finally, the Battle of Gettysburg is almost always linked to a speech Lincoln gave there, known as the Gettysburg Address. 
It is only about 270 words long, but it is one of the most famous speeches in American history. Lincoln spoke at the opening of a cemetery for all the soldiers who had died at Gettysburg. But he also used the event to speak to the entire country about the war. He said, The conflict was a test of whether the American form of government could survive, that is, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. He also pointed to the Declaration of Independence as the country's founding document. He said, The nation had been conceived in liberty, and, he said, it was dedicated to the idea that all men are created equal. Historians have noted that, in the speech, Lincoln changed the reasoning behind the war effort. It continued to be a struggle to reunite the country. But after the Gettysburg Address, it was also more clearly a struggle to free enslaved people. In 1864, Lincoln won re-election to a second term as president. His new vice president was Senator Andrew Johnson from the southern state of Tennessee. At the swearing-in ceremony, the president spoke about the need for the North and South to come together again peacefully. In that speech, his famous second inaugural, Lincoln called on all Americans to finish the war. He urged them to care for the wounded, the wives and children of soldiers killed in battle, and to seek a just and lasting peace. Most importantly, Lincoln asked Americans to reunite with malice toward none, with charity for all. In other words, with respect and kindness. A few weeks later, the war effectively ended. Lincoln's military plan had worked. He had finally found two generals whom he trusted, Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. Sherman led a campaign across the southern states. His path through Georgia, from the city of Atlanta to the city of Savannah, was known as Sherman's March to the Sea. The march destroyed farms and houses along the way. The destruction was terrible. It was also effective. The Confederate Army was left with little food or communication. At the same time, Grant surrounded Lee's army in Virginia. Grant cut these southern troops off from supplies, too. Lee realized he must surrender to Grant, although, he said, he would rather die a thousand deaths. The two men met on April 9, 1865, at a farmhouse in the town of Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. Lee famously wore his finest military uniform and sword. Grant famously wore his fighting clothes, still marked with mud. Lee and Grant spoke briefly. Then Grant wrote the terms of surrender. As Lincoln had asked, the terms were respectful and generous. Lee's officers were free to keep their horses and their weapons, and the Union Army would give the Confederate soldiers food. When some Union troops began to play a victory song, Grant told them to stop. The war is over, he said. The rebels are our countrymen again. Five days after Lee surrendered, Lincoln and his wife, Mary, went to a theater in Washington, D.C. To put it mildly, the last years had been very difficult for them. While Lincoln was supervising the war effort, both his third and fourth son became sick with typhoid. The younger boy recovered. The older did not. Willie Lincoln died in the White House at age 11. Mary and Abraham Lincoln were crushed. Mary Lincoln blamed herself. She believed God was punishing her. In their own ways, the Lincolns continued to mourn in the years after Willie's death. At one point, Lincoln said he hoped he and Mary could feel happier, 
he urged them to have some pleasant times together. So, with the war coming to an end, they went to a light-hearted play at Ford's Theater. It was the night of Friday, April 14, 1865, a day that Christians were marking that year as Good Friday, the anniversary of Jesus' death. The theater was not far from the White House. The Lincolns had seats in a box high above the stage. Toward the end of the performance, a man entered their box and shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. Then the gunman jumped to the stage, breaking his leg as he landed. He called out a Latin expression, Sic semper tyrannis. It means, thus always to tyrants. Some observers say, the man added, the South is avenged. The gunman was a Southerner named John Wilkes Booth. He had plotted to kill the president after hearing Lincoln support voting rights for African Americans. Booth briefly escaped, but was later captured and hanged. Lincoln was taken to a nearby boarding house. He seemed lifeless and could hardly breathe. Doctors examined him, but found they could not save him. Lincoln died the following morning. He was 56 years old. The emotions of many Americans changed from joy at the coming end of the Civil War to shock and mourning. Thousands lined up along railroad tracks as Lincoln's body made its way from Washington, D.C. to his home in Illinois. Even many Southerners mourned Lincoln's death. They understood that he would treat them kindly. A little more than six weeks after Lincoln's assassination, the last Confederate army surrendered, and the war was considered officially over. The country was reunited, and the process of legally freeing enslaved people had begun. Although these acts are tremendous parts of Lincoln's legacy, in time, his public image would grow only larger and more celebrated. As one witness to Lincoln's death reportedly said, now he belongs to the ages. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 